Okay, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. Let's just adjust the volume here. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining me here. I do always wait a few minutes for a bunch of people to roll in. <clears throat> Turn off the YouTube sound here. All right, there's a few comments already. So I, uh, I typically do a little bit of a spiel. Today we're gonna be talking about AMC, of course crazy options trading um, action in AMC. And then afterwards, we'll open it up to questions. So because I actually do have quite a bit to get to, actually the first thing, seems like the lens is focus breathing a little bit. Apologies for that. Um, it's also blasted out maybe 20 minutes ago. It was absolutely perfect. It was cloudy. It looked amazing. And then now looking out there, the sun is out and um, it's a difficult thing to to make look right. So apologies for that. I've got a great view here. I kind of want to share it with everybody, but it's a little bit of a nightmare having a backlit scene like this. So um, yeah, it is what it is. Uh, better to stare at that than my stupid face. So uh, give you some, some scenery to look at. I've got an ND filter. I can Try to clean it up a little bit. Apologies, it, it, it is what it is, so we'll just go with it. Another thing too, I'll just go on the quick rundown here. Something that occurred to me that I will mention is when I was planning the trades that I was gonna talk about and um, you know thinking about a few things that I could say, it's possible that I'm gonna run a little bit late here. So typically for my live streams, if you're new here, um, I do try to keep them about one hour. Ideally, I would like to get them down to about 45 minutes, but uh, anybody who knows me knows I can kind of ramble on a little bit. So, but I do try to keep it an hour. The problem is, I do think that the open Q and A's afterwards is probably people's favorite part of the live streams, um, and I can understand that. There's very few places, if any, maybe that uh, people can actually go and get these types of questions that they have answered. You know, you can, I suppose, you could try to DM people on Twitter. You know, your favorite volatility guys, whatever, whoever they are very unlikely that they're going to actually answer your question. So I do understand that the Q&A is, is really uh, a pretty important part of the show, and I don't want to drown that out. So possible, I'm looking at the three worst AMC trades. We'll get to those first. I might actually have to divide this up. I'm going to keep an eye on the time. If I go much more than 25 or 30 minutes, I'm going to probably stop it. We can always do another one tomorrow or on Monday. So... Um, you know, just a little bit of a heads up there. I might have to split it up and actually do the three best AMC trades uh, tomorrow or, or in a future one. But uh, we'll see how I do. We'll see how much of this I can get through. Sorry. There's, uh, there's also a little seaplane airport right behind me. So uh, let me close that window. Yeah, so thanks everybody for coming. We've got a few people. Um, I'm going to get right into it. So just give me one minute of housekeeping here and then we're going to get started talking about AMC. I'm going to always start default with the worst trades. I think just as a risk manager for me personally, I think it's important to tone down everybody's expectations on all the big profit. And then afterwards, we'll get into some of the better trades later. But I'm always going to default to get people to not do the stupid trades. So we will start with those. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I really do appreciate the support. So my name's Brent Osachoff. I'm a Canadian and I'm a former professional golfer. So you will hear the odd golf analogy slipped in there from time to time. I run, I love movies, diehard UFC fan, and I do love to travel. So you'll see this background change throughout the year. So just give me one minute here to do a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you do feel like you need a little more structure in your investing, I do also manage a private investing community with members from over 65 countries around the world. And it's all centered around both of our diversified portfolios. You can choose the one that best suits your personal level of risk tolerance. There's a daily email sent out every morning with a ton of very useful volatility metrics at the top, which you can learn more about each one of them and start applying them to your own trading. There's a daily article or video where I break down some of the most requested topics from members. And then most importantly, of course, in every email, every day, I state exactly what position each of my strategies will be in, along with all the allocation sizing and risk management that goes with them. I've made it easy to follow so you can get the same consistent performance the VTS community has enjoyed for over nine years now. 
now. No obligation, but if this is something you may be interested in, go to volatilitytradingstrategies.com, click the subscribe tab, and the monthly subscription does come with a free two-week trial, so you can check it all out before committing. Thanks again for supporting the YouTube channel and spending a little bit of time with me here today. So let's get on with the show. Okay, so uh, thanks everybody for, for joining me here today. This is live stream number 15, I believe. We've done many, many more private ones for the community. I think we're on something like 25 there. But uh, yeah, thanks for showing up. And uh, we do the Q&A at the end of the show. But like I said, I'm going to try to get through this as fast as I can. And if we can do them all, great. If I have to split it up, then, you know, that's just what we'll do. So the first trade that um, I don't think it's going to come as any surprise to anybody. And I will remind everybody just, um, just before we get started here that I've done two videos recently. Um, I'll just show you what those are. If you go to my YouTube channel, we've already done two videos on AMC trading. So I've gone through some of the worst, some of the best. Um, in videos like that, I do try to keep them fairly short, seven minutes, 12 minutes. So I didn't get a chance to say everything that I wanted. So right now I'm gonna obviously lead with the worst thing that everybody should be doing is naked short calls. So this is selling call options on, you know, out of the money typically, but this is something that a lot of people get very tempted to do. And I just, I'm gonna just keep harping on this point over and over again until everybody out there listens that there's no reason to ever be selling naked options on anything. So of course, we are a volatility community. We don't ever sell naked options on volatility ETPs. You don't have to do that. It's very inefficient. The long-term profit is terrible, even though the short-term profit can be quite exciting. You obviously have to factor in all the times that it's gonna blow up in your face. And when you add in both the good times and the bad times, then obviously the profit comes back down to earth. So I'm gonna explain as quick as I can, why you shouldn't be doing that on something like AMC. So hopefully, let me just check if I'm on a screen share here. Good. Sometimes I have a tendency to do that from time to time. Um, okay, so when we're looking at AMC, if we try to get a general, general valuation, it's very difficult on these types of stocks because it's mostly based on momentum, right? I don't think anybody out there is actually believing that AMC is just a much better company now than it was two years ago. You know, before the COVID crash, it was anywhere from seven to $10, right? In this range over here. And then COVID hurt all companies. And there's no doubt that AMC was just devastated by COVID, but we could make a case maybe reasonably that it could claw its way back to five or $10. But the fact that it's gone so high, clearly this is just a momentum stock. We've seen this rise, you know, recently in the last couple of years, say, where high short interest coincides with, you know, the, the online Reddit forums and the Wall Street bets crowd, and they can really push things a lot higher than perhaps they deserve to be. So, you know, it's pretty impossible to get a valuation, especially when something, I mean, in this case, it's very extreme from $2 at the start of the year, and it reached a high of 72, it's actually still at 50, which is very impressive. We'll have to see going forward. Maybe it goes to 200, we don't know. Anything is on the table right now. But let's just look what a naked call option would actually look like on AMC. So for all of my examples, I'm gonna use the same expiration. I'm gonna use this July expiration, 34 days. And let's just see what a naked call option would actually look like. So we'll do the 100. Just as an example, typically you can see the at the money right now is about 50. Typically people like to be well out of the money so they get to that point where they can tell themselves in their head that it's never gonna get to that high value. And so let's just imagine a trader who says it's never gonna get to 100. So I'm gonna sell this call option and that actually brings in a significant amount of premium. So, I mean, that's the allure of selling naked call options, of course, is for beginner traders and for people who don't really understand risk management, they see that upfront premium and they really get excited about it. They start doing the math in their head and thinking, well, why do I have to wait three or four years to make 100% return when I can do it all this year? I can just churn through these naked calls and I can just get it done in a quarter of the time. Because of course, these premiums are very, very juicy. And so that's typically why they get trapped in this. But of course, we have to be careful 
because if you know what you're looking at here, this turquoise line is the expiration value. The pink line is the daily profit curve. And right here is today's price. So the break even point is all the way up here. So at 100, you still get max gain. You're going to make for one contract $835. And people tell themselves, well, I can make $835 and there's no way it's going to get to 100. This is a little bit strange to me because of course it can get to 100, right? I mean, if you just stop and think about it for a second, AMC started the year at $2. It has doubled on itself more than five times, right? It went from two to four. That's a doubling of the stock price. You wouldn't think a stock would double, but there it is, it did. And then it went from four to eight. And then it went from eight to 16, and then 16 to 32, 32 to 64, and all the way up to 72. So this thing has already doubled on itself more than five times just in the last five months. I don't understand why people don't think that it could also do it again. Who's to say that AMC couldn't do it again? It couldn't go from 72 to 144. Why not? Why couldn't it go that high? It already has several times before this year. I mean, you get these out of the money call options going, you get what, you know, this short squeeze mixed with a gamma squeeze in the options market. And who knows how high this thing could go. So let's just imagine what happens if the price does do one more double, right? It's already done over five of them. Let's say it does the other one and goes to 144. So what would happen? The first problem was selling naked calls. As you can see, you could be down $6,000 if that happens. So here's a trader who tried to jump into this thing thinking they're going to make a quick and easy 835. The thing just does another double and now you're down $6,000. So that's the first problem with selling calls. And um, it's a big problem. It's a very big problem. People have to understand that juicy premiums way out of the money only pay that because the odds of it getting there are real. If if the odds of it getting there were so low that it's not worth thinking about, then those premiums would be 20 cents. The reason it's an $8.35 premium at the 100 strike is because there's a significant probability they could get there. Not 50-50, but let's be honest, it could quite easily get to 100 and it could even go to 200. It could go to more than that. We have no idea. So price is the first problem of calls, but that's not the only problem that people face. It gets much, much worse than that. So if we look at the implied volatility, this is a two-year chart of AMC. Implied volatility is here, the turquoise line. If we just expand this real quick. Oops, drag that up. We can see that before the COVID mess, implied volatility was about 40 to 60%. Right now, in that option, the implied volatility is 256%. So let's say 250. But in the past, just recently, Here's a period where it went to 528. And here's a period recently where it went to 600. So right now the implied volatility is 250. That's quite high, obviously. It's about five times higher than before, but it's not as high as it could go. So if AMC did double again, which again, we've already established that it very well could, this implied volatility is gonna go through the roof again. Now maybe it doesn't get to 600, but let's just say it gets to 500 again. It's already been to 500 twice. If AMC goes to 144, I would bet good money that it's going to go to 500 again. What will happen? Well, let's do a volatility adjustment here. Let's add 250% volatility. And when I click it, watch what happens to this pink line. You can see the profits down here when I hover over. Right now it says 6,200. When we do the volatility adjustment, see what happened? Now it says 9,000. Now you can lose $9,000 if AMC goes to 144, not the 6,000. It was bad enough that you tried to make 800 and you're down 6,000, but now because volatility rose as well, short calls are what's called Vega negative trades. Vega is the Greek symbol that represents how much the option value will change given changes in the underlying volatility, given a change of a 1% volatility in the underlying. We're talking about a 250% volatility bump you could lose another $3,000 just based on that. But it gets worse. Those two things on their own should make people never do this type of trade again. But there's a third aspect as well. The buying power in every trading account is always based on the actual cash value of the account. 
It's not based on what you think your trade will be two months ago. It's based on what your account says right now today. So if you find yourself down that much money, remember now you're gonna be down 1,000% on this trade. You wanted to make 800, thought you were the smart trader, now you're down eight or 9,000. The buying power in your account is gonna dry up quickly. It's gonna radically change everything in your account. And what you might find is that now you can no longer sustain the position. So you thought you could just keep it on and maybe you'll get lucky and it comes back down, but now the buying power in your account, because it's based on the cash value of your account, now your buying power sucks too. And now that's a third aspect that's going against you. Now you might have to go out and sell all the other positions in your account just to sustain this one. You could dump all the other stocks that you have just so you can try to double or triple down on this losing trade. But again, hopefully people realize how silly that would be. Those are three aspects that people often overlook with selling naked calls. They understand the price can run against you. They often overestimate the impact of that implied volatility change as well. Then the third aspect, your buying power is gonna be a complete mess when this happens to you. But there's a fourth aspect as well. This is sort of the final kill shot in why people should not do this. What can happen, and often does happen, in a crisis, your actual broker can raise margin requirements on you as well. So you trade that you initially started had a certain maintenance requirement to keep the trade open. Sometimes when a bunch of people are losing money or they're worried that customers are gonna get themselves into trouble, brokers themselves will raise margin requirements. And that will take your trade to a whole nother level of bad and you can end up in a margin call even though nothing changed overnight. You know, the price stayed the same, volatility was the same, you're in big, big trouble when it's all the way over here, but you think you'll be able to sustain it, and then you wake up and your broker has actually done the unthinkable, which actually happens quite often, especially in the volatility space. When there's big volatility spikes, don't be surprised if your broker raises margin requirements on you dramatically. But all four of those things combined, you end up with things like this. Somebody emailed or somebody DM'd me this. Um, there's countless examples of this, especially in the volatility space. We get people every few months, people blowing up, every few years blowing up big time. Um, <laughs> never sell naked calls. I feel bad for this person. Obviously, this is terrible. And I hope that, I hope this is a joke. I don't think it is. And even if it is, a whole bunch of other people did the same thing. My 100,000 loss turned into over 600,000 in minutes with AMC. I'm not even sure how I can recover. Um, yeah, that's, that's one of those that it could take you a decade to recover. It could be, I mean, it is a life-changing mistake that um, unfortunately this person made, but uh, that's why you don't do this. I just, people often don't understand the compounding nature of how badly selling naked calls can go against them. They're always looking at the price and they always think to themselves that they can control the risk if it happens to them. So what are the two things that you've heard online, on Twitter, what do people always say when they're promoting selling naked calls and it goes against them? First thing that they will say is you can hedge it, right? If it goes against you, just start hedging it. Typically that means buying shares to cancel out the, the short option that's going so far against you. Can you do that though? Does that make any sense? I mean, I know it sounds good and you think, oh, that'll save me. Can you just hedge? Because remember the move has already happened. So the damage is done, you're way down money. Also, spikes like that can happen very quickly and you can get into a massive liquidity crunch in that hedging and you're just paying a fortune to get those hedges on. You know, the high frequency trading algorithms might be able to get something on, but you just with your broker, you're not gonna be able to efficiently hedge it when it's going like that. Second problem with hedging is the markets are closed. That's what you hear, right? You can hedge. Well, we know that most of the market action happens overnight. So you're going to hedge what? You're going to wake up and maybe it's gapped up on you. You had no opportunity to hedge. So hedging doesn't work. It's one of those things that inexperienced traders talk about that they'll sell a super risky position. And then if it goes badly, I'll hedge. Totally doesn't work. The second one, which makes me even more angry, what will people tell you? Well, you can roll it, right? You just sell the naked call, and if it goes against you, you can just keep rolling it into the future indefinitely. You can just, you're totally safe. If it goes to 144, just roll the position. Well, I just explained that there's four aspects going against the naked call, not just price. That would be like 
you know, just a sports metaphor. I'm kind of a sports guy. Big UFC fan. Huge UFC card tonight, by the way. Kind of pulling for Nate Diaz, but I think he's going to get absolutely starched. But anyway, um, this would be like going into a boxing match with one other opponent. And you think you're going to beat this opponent, right? You sold your 100 call. You brought in your 8 bucks. You think it's an easy win. You're going to get that. You get into the ring, and you find that this opponent is much, much better than you thought they were. And they're beating you up badly. This AMC in this metaphor goes to 144. The price is destroying you. Well, it's not just fighting that guy because when it goes to 144, he gets to invite his friend into the ring. Now there's two guys you're boxing against. His friend is named Implied Volatility. You have to fight him as well now. And now they're both beating you up, right? Now you're getting hit with price and Implied Volatility. Seems bad. A third friend gets into the ring. Buying power, Mr. Buying power gets to get into the ring. Now there's three people beating you up. And just when you think this is completely unfair, how could they do this to me? A fourth person gets into the ring, all teamed up on you. The broker raises margin requirements on you as well. Can you really just roll indefinitely? No, you're absolutely dead. Roll with what? Your money's gone, implied volatility's gone, your buying power dried up, everything is bad, your broker raised requirements. Roll with what? They always say, it's kind of like that thing where you always see people talking about buy the dip. Buy it with what? Did you win the lottery overnight? When you're down that much money, roll with what? That's what you, I always ask them when they say it on Twitter. I'll just roll it out. How? Did you take out a second mortgage on your house and you're going to add money to your trading account? You can't just indefinitely roll positions that go against you. It's just whenever somebody says one of those two things, that it's okay to sell naked calls, and if it goes against you, you will either hedge or roll it out, unfollow them immediately. This is a person who is not a real trader. Anybody who seriously represents that that's their plan to manage the trade that's going badly, they actually believe that you can just hedge it in the moment while prices are going bonkers, or you can just roll it indefinitely even though your buying power is gone. Anybody who represents that as a serious position is not a serious trader. So that is the problem. And I guess I don't even have to explain how badly this could go because again, AMC has done the unthinkable already. It has gone from $2 to 72. I don't think we can realistically start capping this and say, you know what? It's definitely gonna stop at 144. I don't know about that. I would be surprised as well. Believe me, I'm not, I'm not representing that I believe AMC is gonna go to 200, but it could. Why couldn't it? Why couldn't AMC go to 200 and you get a volatility adjustment? Now your little trade, for 800 bucks has cost you everything. And then you end up being like that person I showed the screenshot. It happened so fast. They thought they were the smart money. Turns out, not so much. So short calls, naked calls, and please, on volatility ETPs as well, please understand. If this is um, UVXY, for example, just going to a little side tangent. Anybody who says that it's safe to sell UVXY calls and then seriously represents a position that if it goes against them, they will either hedge or roll it, doesn't know what they're talking about. UVXY can go insanely high extremely quickly. Off market hours or during a flash crash or God forbid a, a terrorist attack or a chemical explosion, insert bad you know, market behavior these things can go an insane amount. You could look, look at here, it went from 100 to 1300. You're gonna just roll that indefinitely? How? You're gonna hedge that? How? We had a volatility, we had a volpocalypse. You can't hedge those types of things. They just, they come out of nowhere. If you look at the premiums on UVXY, 34 days out, if you look at the put side, the 25 strike might pay you $1.30, $1.35. The at the money call will pay you 450. So there are a lot of inexperienced traders who don't understand risk management that think that this is the smart money. Sell the short call. But what they don't realize is they'll pay you $1.25 all the way out to the 75 strike. Why? Why is there still significant premium all the way that far out? Don't people ask themselves these questions? Why are market makers giving you a market? $40 out of the money, and they're still giving you the same premium that they would give if you just sold a put $5 out of the money. 
Why does that market exist? Risk, risk reward. You can't get away from this. Market makers will give you the rope to hang yourself if you want to, but selling naked calls on AMC or GameStop or UVXY or even the stock market, no. There's a reason those premiums are that juicy. You can't look at the premiums and say, wow, I can just accelerate my growth by just doing this right now. Three or four of these in a row, I'm gonna be good. Well, that's not gonna work for you. So please, naked calls. I mean, obviously I can't tell people directly what to do, but I hope I got my point across that you're not just fighting price. You're fighting four different boxers in the ring all wailing on you at the same time. And you have no idea how badly and how quickly this can go against you. So um, let's move on from the long calls or the, sorry, the naked short calls. I will die on this hill. I will, if, if I do one thing right in my investing career, I will get people to understand how quickly that trade can go against you. Number two, long puts. This one is a little bit weird. Long put options doesn't seem that risky. And remember, when I'm talking about these things, I'm not saying it can't make money. I'm just saying that these are trades that people underestimate how badly they can go for them. So let's talk about the long put option. Why would that be a risky trade? So if we look back at AMC, let's say for the sake of argument that a person thought, okay, it was at seven to 10 before the spike, before COVID. It's probably worth seven to 10 now, but these Reddit forums are powerful. I mean, these are not, the whole narrative that these are just a bunch of broke people, you know, living in their mom's basement with $1,000 in their trading account, that's obviously not true. These people clearly have, you know, multiple millions of followers in these forums with significant capital behind them and some pretty significant organization in times as well. So let's say we pay respect to them and we don't think it's gonna go back to 10, but somebody thinks it's gonna go to 20. Okay, that's realistic. It peaked out at 20 right there. They just think it's gonna go back to this point. Well, the long, the long put option is a thought that some people have in their head. Let's buy a long put option. Uncheck that one. Let's just choose one of these and buy a long put option. And I'll explain to you why this trade isn't quite as good as people think it is. So today's price is right here, this hash line, right around 50. The long put option profits if AMC price goes down. And you can see, oh, I have to readjust my volatility, sorry. Let's go back to uh, zero vol. Okay, so you can see what happens here. You don't have to wait till expiration. The expiration is the turquoise line. You don't have to wait 34 days to get your profit. Options change dynamically moment to moment. So as this thing is going down, you can see how this long put buyer is actually making money. So if this thing goes to about $34, they think they're gonna make 500 bucks. If it goes to 30, they think they're gonna make $675. What they're not factoring in is remember, if AMC goes back down to 20, that probably means that the hype is dying down as well. I'm just gonna check if I'm on screen share. I do that several times a day. Um, that probably means the hype is dying down and implied volatility is gonna go down. Well, this trade right here is what is called Vega positive which means it profits when volatility goes up and it loses money when volatility goes down. Long put options are Vega positive trades, which is very dangerous to open when we've got volatility at 256%. Because if you're right, I'm gonna show you what is likely to happen if AMC goes down. Let's say it does go to 30. You're not gonna make $655. What's gonna end up happening is volatility will depress. So instead of 250, it might go to 100. That's still double its long-term average, but it might go down. You see what happened to your trade? That pink line has now dipped negative. And even if it goes to 30, you'll make a little bit of money, but you'll only make $123. You're not gonna make the 674. That's what happens with these Vega positive trades as they bleed down and you think you're guessing correctly, you wanted it to go down and it does, you still end up not making any money. And this is one of the things that really surprises traders. It's not necessarily that this is a terrible trade and you're gonna lose your shirt and they're gonna liquidate your account. It's a long option, so you can only lose what you put in. It's not nearly as bad as the naked short call, but I just wanna warn people that these don't behave the way you think it will. When the price starts going down, your profit will not increase because the implied volatility will crash down as well. If you want a 
more detailed look of this. I wonder if I can just find it really quick under VIX. Here's one. This video right here, why VIX put options don't work. I basically went in detail with several examples showing when the VIX spiked up to the 75 to the 80 range, buying 20 and $30 put options didn't make any money. And that really goes contrary to what a lot of people think. They think that, well, what I'm supposed to do trading, wait for something to go to extreme levels and then buy those put options. So wait till the VIX goes over 40 and buy the $20 puts. Because we all know it's mean, median and mode reverting. It will eventually go back down to the 20s and the 15s. So that's what they do. They rush out and they buy those put options. What they don't realize is the implied volatility is gonna crash down on them and th that trade's not gonna make any money. So when the VIX goes from 75 to 25, that $25 put option doesn't make any profit. The, the premium that you paid to get into the trade was so high and such an, a heavy upfront cost and headwind that by the time you're actually proved correct and the thing does go back down, well, this is what it looks like. Profit just disappears. That daily gain loss, I mean, of course you can wait till expiration and you'll get your money then, but then you need it to go below 30 just to break even. So what people are actually counting on is that they will be making profit along the way. And that's just not the case. So that's the second trade that, um, that people should be careful about. Again, it's not going to cause margin calls and your broker's not going to, you're not going to owe the bank money doing this, but just be very careful doing this. The third one that I want to talk about is another one that again, I'm not necessarily saying that this is a bad trade. I'm not saying that this can't be managed to a profit. It can, but I'm just drawing attention to potential pitfalls of where this could go wrong. And that is selling short put options, right? A lot of people think, well, okay, I understand volatility is going to collapse and I'm paying a lot for my puts. So I should take the opposite side of the trade and I should sell the put options instead. We can actually take a look at what that's going to do as well. So we'll close this one. And again, people typically do way out of the money. They tell themselves it's never going to get there. So we're going to sell this 20 put. And again, we have 34 days to expiration. So plenty of time to see this trade develop. This is what the short put looks like. Now, this is somewhat specific to my community, but I have an option strategy in our VTS options community called the wheel of fun. And essentially what the wheel of fun is, is you start with an underline in this case AMC, and you sell a way out of the money put option. All right, you bring in that premium. Now there's two ways this can go down. The first way is that it expires above 20. In that case, you keep your premium, you don't get assigned any shares, and it's a profitable trade and you just find something new. Or you just roll to another one. But no harm, you get your money, you get your profit. The other thing that can happen is that it dips below the strike price that you sold. So if it goes below 20, you're on the hook for those shares. You now get assigned those shares at $20. You do keep your premium, but now you hold the shares at 20. And then of course, what you can do and why it's called the wheel of fun is because then you have shares, you can turn around and sell covered calls to bring in premium to start whittling away at your cost basis to the point where you're profitable and you can actually get out of the trade with a profit. So that's the wheel. You can start with a put option, get assigned the shares, sell the covered calls, get rid of the shares, rinse, repeat. Or you can start with the call, cash secured call, get assigned the short option, the short shares, sell cash or sell puts to bring in premium and get that wheel going. The problem with something like AMC is that A, it's, a, it's too fast moving a stock and B, the implied volatility is too unpredictable. So here's what can end up happening if you do this. Right now, it's paying 75 cents. And let me just say, I'll grant you the fact that it's probably not gonna get below 20, okay? So we'll just assume that you're right. The problem that people don't realize is it doesn't have to get below 20 to get into serious trouble with this trade. So it's gonna cost you $2,000 in margin, give or take. Some brokers will give you much cheaper than that, um, but about $2,000. You can see as it starts to go down, even though it's not to 20 yet, you can still start losing a significant amount of money. Per one contract, this only makes $75. You can see it here, $75 profit. Well, you could easily lose $200 if it goes to 30, right? That's a big problem. But a bigger problem is, remember what we said, 
Implied volatility is extremely unpredictable on AMC. It's gone anywhere from 100 to 600, and it's currently at 250. So it could do anything. The problem with this trade, well, one of several problems, is again, this is a Vega negative trade. It profits when volatility goes down, and it loses money when volatility goes up. So what were to happen if, vol if this thing did start to make a run at those high levels and implied volatility this turquoise line, implied volatility started creeping up to these levels again. What if that were to happen? Well, this trade could actually end up losing a lot more than you think. So if you do a volatility adjustment, and this isn't even to the peak, let's actually go to the secondary peak of 500 volatility. Remember, it could go to 600. But just at the peak of 500, you're already down $544. You did the trade to try to make 75 bucks, and now you're down $550. This is obviously way, way past the risk tolerance that people initially see on these types of trades. They see something that, hey, if it stays high, I'm good. If it goes down, I'm still fine. If it goes below 20, I'll just take my shares and I'll sell covered calls. What they don't realize is that implied volatility could really crush the trade and you could lose a fortune before you even get to your strike price. So if we go to this think back function, on Thinkorswim, I, I know other brokers seen them called Time Machine or something like that. But if we use Think Back and we find our strike right now, here's the 20, you can see the premium that it's paying. I'll just highlight that. 76 cents. Well, let's go back a little bit. Back one day, it was at $1.30. So if you sold it today at 77 cents and it goes back to where it was the day before, you nearly lost 100% of your money. You lost, what, 80% of your capital just one day. But if we start clicking backwards, let's go to the previous, what is that, Monday? The previous Monday, $180, $1.80. That's more than double your profit or your, the, your cost. If we keep going back just to the previous Friday, one week before this, 260 so, I mean, selling at 77 cents when it just a week ago, the price was at $48. The price is basically the same as it is now, but the premium could be way different. Could be in your favor. There's no doubt it could be in your favor, but it could also go way, way against you. Take an example, 521. The problem with that trade is that the idea that you can A, just collect your money and just let it sit, that's an issue because you really can't. You can't let something sit where you sold it for trying to make $75 and now you're down 500. Because you're down 500, it might go to seven, it might go to eight. At some point, self-preservation is gonna kick in and you're gonna have to close this trade for a loss, even if it only goes to 30. So that's one of the risks that people wanna consider. The second thing that people don't consider is that your plan to sell covered calls down the road might get foiled by the fact that if you are right and it actually goes down, what ends up happening to those covered calls? Let's look at what the expected premiums on these covered calls might be. So on this date, it goes down to 12. Well, we're just assuming that this goes way past somebody's price, right? They sold it here. They think it's never going to get to 20 and it actually does. Let's say it goes to 10. I don't think that's really that unreasonable at all. 20 is right there. This, you can see this basing period on AMC literally two, three weeks ago is 10 bucks. I don't think anybody would be surprised if 35 days from now it reached just this plateau. I mean, forget about all this. We're just talking about here. This is $10. So for somebody to say, oh, it's never going to get below 20. Well, it could easily get to 10. Obviously that could quite easily happen. So what if it does? If we look at our think back, the last time it was somewhere near there, about $12, what are the covered calls paying? The $20 covered calls when it's sitting at 12? Well, not much. Let me uh, adjust this to get the typical one month expiration cycle. Not a whole lot. It's gonna take you a long, long time to be able to generate enough premium. Sorry, this is 2021 with 400% volatility. I'm gonna go back to 2019, sorry. 
Um, same, same concept though. It's sitting at 13 and we're trying to get an idea for what happens when the volatility goes back to normal and this thing goes back to 10 and everybody kind of moves on. The Wall Street Bets crowd move on and everything kind of settles into this secondary plateau right there at around $10. If that were to happen, what can we expect a one month covered call to pay? Well, nothing, right? Pennies. Literally, you might get five cents if you're lucky. Even going two or three dollars out of the money, you're only getting pennies. And even if we grant that volatility might stay elevated at about 100%, not the 46, which is normal here, you're still talking about two or three dollars out of the money, you might get 10 cents. How are you going to whittle down your cost basis selling covered calls when you're out $10 and you can only get 10 cents a month? How is, I mean, it's going to take you years to get that money back. So again, I'm not necessarily saying that this is a terrible trade that's going to cost you a fortune and your broker is going to liquidate you. Maybe not. But the two bad things that can happen is one, implied volatility could go up on you. And even if the price stays here, you could still go five, six times down on your money. You could lose 600% of your capital. Or if it goes down here, you could be stuck selling covered calls for a decade and not get back to your cost basis. So the two rules, essentially, the two things that I look for when I'm talking about my wheel of fun strategy is one, you want an underlying that can't really get too far out of control. Obviously, the more volatility, the better. You'll get those premiums, but you don't want something that can go from 50 to 10, and that would be totally normal. Because I think we can agree, going from 50 to 150 is definitely possible. Going from 50 to 10, definitely possible. Anybody who says, oh, it can't do that, yes, it can. So that's the first problem, is that you could lose money even if it doesn't go down. The second problem is you could end up in a situation where you are a decade holding capital, tying up capital in your trading account, trying to fight back to break even on a trade that long since went against you. It's just a... Uh, it's a very bad target for a wheel of fun trade. So you want to look for things that have predictable implied volatility and somewhat predictable stock price. You don't have to nail it exactly. Of course, the point is to roll those, to roll through the wheel when you're wrong, but it has to be reasonably predictable. AMC doesn't count. Volatility ETPs doesn't count. GameStop won't work. Anything crypto in the future, you know, if we do start to get liquid options, those won't work. All of those things that can move violently and implied volatility can change significantly. Those are all off the table. You cannot do short puts on those things either. It is too dangerous. So those are the three trades. Obviously, this is number one. I should have put 10 red boxes around naked short calls. Don't ever do that one. Long puts, be aware that that implied volatility can absolutely smother you when the price is going down. And short puts, again, Make sure that the implied volatility is somewhat predictable and the price can't move from 50 to 10 on you and, and just leave you caught in a trade that you don't want to carry this for 10 years. Trust me, you don't want to, in 2030, you don't want to be saying, I've still got this, you know, anchor of a trade from 2021 in AMC and I'm still only at $15 cost basis. You, you really don't want that. So um, let's check out the time here. I feel like I... Probably burned through, um, probably burned through a little bit too much. So yeah, yeah, unfortunately, I can babble. <laughs> um, hopefully people found a little bit of value in there. Uh, there's no way I'm gonna get to the best trades, um, the careful trade. People like the Q&A section, um, and I definitely wanna respect the fact that uh, some of you are here for that, so. Um, yeah, just gonna cut it in half right here. That's it, we're gonna, maybe tomorrow, maybe tomorrow we'll do the second one. And right now we'll just open it up to the, uh, the Q&A section. Maybe tomorrow, maybe Monday, I will come in on this number two, the best AMC trades. In my opinion, I'm a risk manager. I, I never call myself an asset manager or you know uh, a trader sometimes it slips out, but I'm a risk manager. So I'm gonna hit you with three or four, in my opinion, really safe ways to still participate in AMC because it's exciting, it's awesome, it's going you know going bonkers. We all like it, but you don't want to get liquidated by your broker. So I I definitely want to give people some ideas they can run with that uh, maybe you make a few bucks, but you know you're not going to get you're not going to get caught in something unexpected because that's the thing with options trading. 
I got to tell you, most of the people that trade options are pretty inexperienced. And there's nothing wrong with that. We all start at the same place. But a lot of people just don't really understand how badly these things can go if the market moves against you, especially when you start factoring in the Greeks. When I say it's a Vega negative trade or a theta positive trade or you got to watch the gamma on this trade, um, a lot of people just don't really know what that means. And then they get caught, you know, out in the rain without an umbrella. So, um, Definitely come back, tune in for the next one. But let's just do the Q&A. It's always open. Ask me anything you want. You can ask me about what I just rambled on there, AMC. And we'll just get to as many of these as we can. So um, apologies if it ran a little late. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. 168 people here. Good job. Um, thanks so much. Hit the like button for me. It's super helpful while you're watching me talk here. Um, very, very helpful. So. David Lincoln popped in. Uh, you guys don't know David Lincoln, and he also has a volatility-specific YouTube channel and Twitter account and whatnot. So you can Google or search in YouTube David Lincoln, and you can also go on Twitter. It's at the famous Dave, and famous is spelled F-A-M-I-S. So it's at the famous Dave. Um, you can follow him as well. He's uh, he's a really good guy in the volatility space. He says that he, um, I've been following him a little bit. He's more of a GameStop guy. Um, I don't trade these things, just full disclosure. I, whenever I see these high flying stocks, honestly, y you know, you're not gonna get rich off it. Everybody wants to be a millionaire of trading AMC. What's most likely to happen is if you take on excessive risk, you're gonna realize that, uh, or chase excessive reward, you're gonna realize that it also comes with excessive risk. But David Lincoln has been trading GameStop. He says that he's uh, he's paired it back a little bit. Um, good stuff. Little teaser for the next follow-up video. He's he's talking about vertical spreads here. Very, very smart way to play these high-flying stocks. So obviously a, a market veteran like David is not going to get into naked call options. He's doing verticals. Looks like he might still be a little bit of a short bias, but um, opened up a put spread there to offset a little bit of the... The damage because this Wall Street bets team, I mean, say what you want about them. I mean, you can call them people, traders in their mom's basement, whatever. They they have strength here and they're doing a very, very good job. I'm just every day I see it see them either maintain or go up again. Their resilience is phenomenal. So um yeah. Gotta pay respect to them and do these vertical spreads like he's talking about. It's not a super risky trade, much safer than buying puts or selling naked calls or shorting the underline. Yeah, all three of those bad. Buying puts, we went over. Selling naked calls, I hammered it to death. Shorting the underline, insert that right after selling naked calls. Yeah, don't do that either. It's an unlimited loss trade. Um, give David Lincoln a follow. He, uh, he knows his stuff. He knows not to dip a toe in those silly trades. Um, what are your thoughts on TQQ? So TQQ is the triple leveraged NASDAQ ETF. What are my thoughts on holding it long term? Um, well, I'm not a buy and hold investor, period. I hold nothing long term, literally nothing. Um, every single strategy, all of my trades, all of my options trading, it's all tactical, it's all short term. I might hold positions for several weeks at a time, the same position, but that's only because I've checked the signals every single day and confirmed that it's still a viable trade. I don't hold anything long term. If you wanted, I mean, what's my opinion? Markets bleed upwards over time. So, you know, if you know how to manage your risk, I don't even want to answer this because I'm going to give you the impression that it's okay and it's eventually going to go up. It is. I mean, if, if you want to come back 20 years from now, why is the lens pulsing there? Sorry. Focus breathing. Nice view, but... I'm such a rookie camera guy. I just backlit scenes. I can't make it work. So yeah, sorry to uh, kind of punt on this question, but obviously markets go up long term. I mean, just look at a long term chart. You'll realize that. So yeah, triple ne triple leverage Nasdaq will probably be higher 20 years from now than it is now. But uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even consider doing that they, with tactical investing and with options trading and with risk management. You, you can totally do way better than uh, than buy and hold. That's the whole point of my business is to show people that you don't have to lock into this silly buy and hold thing that all the portfolio managers are getting their clients into. Those pie charts where 
you hold several competing non-correlated assets, or they think non-correlated, then markets crash and correlations go to one. But um, yeah, you don't have to do that. Follow my work. You can. I'll give you plenty of great ideas for getting introduced to tactical investing. Okay, Canadians don't lock their doors. No, we typically don't. Um, and that's dumb because it's not like Canada's without crime. I, I remember we've actually, when I was growing up, we we would occasionally go on vacation and realize when we come back, like, oh, we forgot to lock the doors. Be away for three weeks. We just, we just leave the house. Um, yeah, s silly Canadians. Um, we do that. I do that. You know, speaking of what I didn't actually, I locked it, but what is it, three days ago? Three days ago, my, my vehicle was smashed. My back window was smashed. And the only reason I have that vehicle, so for anybody who doesn't know me, I'm a digital nomad. I travel around. I, I'm a, per a perpetual traveler, basically. Um, I have, I spend about five months in Vancouver, about five months in Taiwan. But my goal is just to travel Europe, to travel Asia. And uh, the only reason I have a vehicle is when I came back to Vancouver, I bought it basically as a storage locker, right? So I I just buy the vehicle and I can stuff my Nespresso machine and my golf clubs and everything that I don't really need day to day. I just put it in the back of the car. Totally blacked out um, tint. It was broken into. They took my golf clubs. They took my camera. They took, uh, yeah, I, I lost about, I don't know, $10,000 worth of stuff. Um, but I did lock the car, so I wasn't a totally stupid Canadian, but kind of dumb Canadian because when you leave a car full of belongings... I mean, if I'm a thief, right next to me was just a crazy uh, 800 horsepower Brabus G63, the G-Wagon. Um, they didn't touch that thing because they probably had a flashlight. They peeked into the window and saw that, oh, there's some golf clubs sitting there. So, um, yeah. Silly Canadians, don't, uh, don't, don't listen to us. We're very trusting people. Okay. AMC is a meme stock. Me, me, huh? Selfish gene. <laughs> Good way to get sheep into the shearing shed. I like that. Yeah. And thanks, Tom, for showing up. I see you a lot in the in the live streams. How accurately would Black Shoals be able to price options if they went from 50 to 150? Not at all. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure you're asking the question because you already kind of know that it's difficult to rely on option pricing models like that. And the Greeks can only get you so far. I mean, it's it's nice to look at it and say, all else being equal, this is what it'll look like. But I'm sure you've experienced, you know that as soon as the market does what you're trying to price and anticipate, it might look completely different. So um, experience, I, I would rely on experience kind of just to know what it's likely to look like then. That's why I went through those models of, so if you're buying a long put option, you can see the chart. It actually looks pretty good, right? If we look at this, long put option. This doesn't look very diabolical. This looks fine. But you kind of have to know that if you do this volatility adjustment and you get a vol crush, it's going to look radically different than it will before. And this isn't even accurate because like you're alluding to, these option pricing models do have some some flaws. They have some, you know, some blind spots. So I would say not very. I would say probably try to... Uh, Try to rely more on your personal experience. And and I know you, you probably trade a lot. So yeah, you, you know what it'll look like if it goes to 150. You know what it'll look like if it goes to 10. Um, and, and use the option spread that best matches that. Uh, we don't like to get blindsided by, oh, I didn't know volatility could crush. I didn't know my broker could change maintenance requirements. I didn't know that my buying power was based on that. And now I have to sell my Apple shares because I didn't know that this position was going to do that. That's what we're trying to avoid. So um all right, let's follow up question. When market makers sell those options, how do they hedge? Typically with uh, underlying shares. That's why just I'll just do a little side tangent as I always do. If you want to understand more, I did a video talking about what a short squeeze and a gamma squeeze actually is, but typically they are being caused by the fact that the market makers, that's what they typically do. Um, they will buy the underlying. So People buy a bunch of long options on AMC or GameStop. Market makers have to come in and they have to actually hedge their position. They're not in the market to speculate. They're there to create the market and, and make some arbitrage money and whatnot. So they actually have to buy the underlying shares. And um, 
maybe I should have finished your question. You probably said that. As I understand, they're buying the underlying. Yep, they are. And sell the stock as it decays. So, I mean, obviously being a market maker, and I alluded to David Lincoln before, David Lincoln was a market maker. So if you follow his channel, his YouTube channel, he oftentimes gets back to, you know, the good old days of being a market maker on the SIBO. It's not easy stuff. You have to, especially on AMC, can you imagine the job of a market maker on something like that? But yeah, they'll buy the underlying stock. They'll do the best they can to Delta hedge their portfolio to try to stay ahead of it somewhat and try to remain as neutral as possible. But even for them, sometimes, sometimes they'll just have to give really disadvantage to the traders, right? They have to. They, they can't provide what they feel is a totally fair and equal market because it can move against them as well. So sometimes on the fringes, you'll see some pretty weird stuff too, where um, people buy them up, people buy up those premiums, but it's kind of probably not worth it. It's, it's pretty tough to price these and to constantly hedge something. But yeah, that's probably the default go-to is uh, underlying shares. That's typically why um, volatility markets are quite complex because oftentimes you can't just go out and buy the shares. You can't buy the VIX. You can't own the VIX. So um, hedging becomes a little bit inefficient and requires an extra level of knowledge to do it correctly. This is why I only trade shares so far. Playing options is a big brain stuff that I haven't gained competency at yet. Darth Sidious. I'm kind of a Star Wars fan myself. Um, yeah, buying the shares. Tune in for my next live stream. Give me an opportunity to convince you that there are a few of the best AMC option trades that you might actually like better than buying the shares. Because you got to remember that AMC, even though buying shares, you can only lose what you put in. So again, you're not going to get into a situation where your broker just blindsides you. But again, it's a fast moving product. And uh, buying shares might not actually be as safe as people think it is. So tune in. We'll try to talk about some option strategies that might get you get you what you want. You want to play in this pool, but you don't just you know, want to get hit with the tsunami. Maybe I can, uh, maybe I can help you out. What is this Tom Sosnoff stuff? Sometimes there's some crosstalk in the comments and I don't know what's going on. Tom Sosnoff is, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, if you're here for the options side, the tasty trade guy. Um, of course, thinkorswim, TD Ameritrade, kind of built the platform, now does tasty works. So let's see what is going on. Taught us all how to sell naked calls. I don't know. I don't really watch tasty trade. Boy, I hope that's wrong. I hope you're being sarcastic or something. I can't even imagine a serious trader. And that's why I made a point to say, I have no doubt there are people out there that you follow that tell you it's okay to sell naked calls. I have no doubt that you can find people that say that. But I made a specific point to say no serious investors sell naked calls. And I think that's the distinction. And I would definitely say Tom Sosnoff is a serious investor. So I hope you're being sarcastic there. Um, selling naked calls is, is a ridiculous way to try to make money. And like I've always tried to say, obviously the price movements are going to be disastrous. The implied volatility changes. The buying power screws you up. The margin accounts at your broker might change. There are so many ways this can go badly. Four boxing guys, you're trying to go into a boxing match against four people at once. Um, but even if you just ignore all of that, let's just focus on the fact that it is incredibly inefficient, right? I mean, it's just the fact that if you start with risk and then try to hedge, you're starting from a place where it's going to cost you a fortune to make that trade safer. What I always do as a risk manager is I start with safety. I start with the safest trade structure possible, something that's not going to get me into trouble, something that I can predict long term. And then I look for ways to add on extra profit from that safety. But what you'll often find on Twitter is, sorry, the lens is focus pulsing and I can't quite reach the manual focus. Otherwise I would hit the manual. Um, what was I saying? Uh, so yeah, the, the reason that naked calls, people talk about that. It's the inefficiency that bothers me as well, that all those people who are telling you it's okay to do it, it's not because all the money that you have to spend to make sure that that trade is safe in the first place, that burns through all the potential capital. So you might see those juicy premiums and you might think, wow, this is 
this is amazing, but you can't just sell the call, right? Of course you have to hedge it. You have to maybe buy shares when it's going against. You have to do all these crazy things to hedge it. And then you end up burning your efficiency anyway. And it gets right back to a trade that is worse than just somebody who started with safety and then added layers of, of reward on top of that. But on Twitter, social media rant here, I often go off these social media rants. Why do people say that selling naked calls is okay? So we're volatility traders. Why would somebody on Twitter say that it's okay to sell naked calls on UVXY? Why would they do that? Clearly they know that it's not. If they know anything about trading, they know how expensive it's going to be to hedge it. And they know that unexpected events like flash crashes and things like that do happen. And there's no possible way to long-term profit from selling naked calls. Why do they say it? Well, there's two things. One, on Twitter, you're never gonna have to show evidence of anything. So that's one thing in their favor. The other thing is, gets a lot of eyeballs. You've seen some of these trading gurus online. Some of them honestly can have hundreds of thousands of followers. I've seen YouTube channels with 300,000 followers from these guys that I don't think they could make $10 if their life depended on it. People on Twitter who have massive followings, 100,000 followers, 150,000 followers, who I guarantee you are not profitable traders. But the things they're talking about are quick money, fast money, get it now, take on the risk, it's okay, you can always hedge it, you can always roll it indefinitely. That gets eyeballs. Somebody like me, I've been doing this for 15 years, talking about safety, risk management, long-term success, start with safety, build from there. This is boring stuff. I mean, it is very difficult for me to get followers. Anybody who's watching right now, 280 people, thank you for showing up because it is very difficult to get anybody interested in safety and risk management. If I went on Twitter and started talking about selling naked calls on UVXY, within a year, I'd have 100,000 followers. That gets eyeballs. Collect those fat $5 premiums. That's what people like to see. They don't like somebody telling them that it's gonna take you five years to grow your account. It might take you four years to double your value. They want somebody to tell them it's, it's possible to do it in six months. So that's the people that are doing it. They're not serious traders. They've never shown a track record. They will never profit long-term, but they'll have a lot of followers. And you'll be thinking, wow, he must know what he's talking about. He's got 50,000 followers. They don't. Again, some traders talk about selling naked calls. No serious trader sells naked calls. There's a distinction there. So um, yeah, follow, Follow who you want, obviously, but be very, very careful. So getting back to this Sosnoff stuff, I don't know. I don't, I'm not a tasty trade guy. I think getting started in your option trading journey, I'll try to put something together as sort of like a beginner course for people, but I, I don't think there's anything wrong with tasty trade initially. But I think what you'll find is you'll quite quickly graduate to understanding that Again, a lot of it is popcorn marketing. A lot of it is stuff that doesn't really work in trading, but it sounds good. And technically speaking, it's on paper. You know, sell iron condors if it gets to this implied volatility rank, things like that. They, they sound great, but you'll quite quickly graduate to more advanced stuff. So, uh, but start with Tasty Trade. I think Tom does, he's a phenomenal communicator. He's obviously a brilliant guy. He built the platform that I still use. So I would never badmouth him or, or anybody over there. But, um, you know, for more advanced stuff and, and things that actually work with long-term profit, you might want to go further than, than those uh, basic things. Ham seat of the moon. Yeah, well, maybe the moon will come and then all these people, like I talked about, all these poor souls that thought, you know, I sell a, <laughs> I'll sell a hundred naked call because, I mean, who, how could it possibly go there? What if it goes to the moon? Like I said, what if it goes to 144? And what if volatility bumps up another 200%, which it would easily do if AMC went to that far? Well, now you're in big trouble, right? Obviously now you've lost a thousand percent of your money and uh, yeah, big, big problem. So AMC might go to the moon. It might go right back to $10. We have no idea. And account for that uncertainty in your selection of option trades, please, because um, once we all, and it applies to me too, I, I always tell everybody, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm not, you know, Nostradamus, I don't know. We have to be able to, right at the very beginning, we have to admit we don't know what's going to happen. Anytime somebody thinks they know what's going to happen, 
they're introducing themselves to uh, to get blindsided. We don't know. AMC could go to 200. It really could. That's a lot of rockets. I don't know what Clove is. Um, for for me personally, this might come as somewhat of a surprise to people. But um, I don't actually trade very much. So when people ask me, hey, what do you think of this stock? Um, I don't usually even know what they are, let alone you know any opinion on them. I trade tactical strategies, only my own stuff. I mean, as they say, I'm a chef that eats my own cooking. I trade entirely my own strategies and literally almost nothing else. I'm always experimenting with a few things, right? I've always got 10 or 15 strategies on the side that I might put 10 or 20 grand in and just see how they work in live trading. But for the vast majority of my capital, I stick to what I do. So sometimes people ask me to deviate outside of what I'm doing. Like for example, this strategy here, all this strategy is is tactical strategy using MDY, which is the S&P 400, IEF, seven to 10 year US treasuries and GLD. We are just tact, or this is the leveraged version, so MVV, but tactically rotating between three possible positions. This is what that strategy does. So it doesn't actually leave a whole lot of room for me to, um, and every Q and A I get people ask, hey, what do you think of this? I don't know. What is Clove? I, I don't even know what that is. There's one way to find out. What do I think about Clove? Clover Health Investments Corp. Wow. So is this, I mean, is this the next Wall Street Bets thing that everybody's taught? I don't know. I don't know. It made it to 28. This is awful. I mean, if, if you want my general assessment, I think it's awful. I, I don't like looking at things that go from $2 to 72. Um, how can anybody honestly think that they can control what could happen next? A more AMC to the moon, thoughts on TBT. Um, I don't do any inverse bonds of any kind. My bond positions are safety only. They're not, I mean, they do make money over time. The time that we are tactically in bonds, we have made profit long term. Um, but I don't target profit for my bond positions. They are safety when it's too risky to be short ball, too risky to be long equities, especially two times leveraged long equities. Then I'll hold bonds, but I don't get into um, inverses of any kind. So you're on your own with that one. So what this implies is hedge funds have gotten themselves into serious trouble. It might, or it might imply that the hedge funds are the ones making money. I, I hear this narrative as well, and you, you could be absolutely right. Maybe that does mean that, but um, hedge fund managers are pretty smart too. Um, very, very smart. They may not make much profit. We've talked about that a lot, that there are many, many headwinds to managing a successful hedge fund and the vast majority of them dramatically underperform, you know, not only their benchmark, but the market as well. But they're smart people. So I don't know. I, don't, I wouldn't, I'd be careful drawing that conclusion. I know that in the AMC and the Wall Street bets on those forums, that's often the narrative is it's us against them. It's us against the hedge funds. We're crushing them. And if that's the case, if it's hedge funds on the short side and, and Wall Street bets on the long side, then congratulations, Wall Street bets. You won. You beat all the, you know, the Wharton and Harvard graduates on Wall Street. Because uh, anybody who was short at two, and there were lots of people, short interest very high, all the way at those low levels. Yeah, you guys won. Wall Street bets won. And they'll continue to win. I, I've been continuously telling people that even though I don't dip a toe in these waters, I don't typically trade these high flyers. I just sort of get my popcorn and enjoy it from the sidelines. Um, my guess is they'll continue to win. You just, you can't have this much momentum and influence and social media out there and not get a lot of massive outsized victories once in a while. So I don't think all of them will win. I mean, I don't think you just go on Wall Street bets and everything they mention, you just go buy it. But you will get a few diamonds in the rough where they just go to insane valuations. This is more same idea. I don't know what that is either. And I don't know what this is either. So we'll just leave all those. I'm very specific to what I do. Volatility, short vol, tactical investing with stocks, bonds, gold utilities. And that's pretty much it. Um, and then a lot of options trading. But again, my options trading is typically on larger, more stable assets like the S&P, 
the S&P components like XLE, XLU, things like that. Individual stocks that are very stable, um, that's what I target. Safety first, then look for ways to add profit after that. Start with safety. And a lot of these little names, um, sure there's ways to play them, but um, it's hard to start with safety with something that's so unpredictable. So I tend, just me, I tend to stay out of it. TD Ameritrade leveraged me more than enough money to buy star and then they changed the percentage in margin called me and saw 76 shares of amc stock of mine on friday sounds like a lawsuit to me so i think to paraphrase what you're saying it sounds like you thought you were fine something went against you a little bit and they changed margin requirements on you if that's if that's what you're saying i don't know if that's what you're saying if that is what you're saying um a, I feel bad that that happened to you. I'm sorry that happened to you. B, I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news, but there's no lawsuit there. Um, I, I hear this a lot that there's somehow, we, we saw it with the XIV termination. Unfortunately, XIV behaved exactly as it was designed to behave. We just, you know, at the time when XIV was made, they didn't anticipate that the volatility ETP market would be several billion dollars and it would eventually, 10 years later, outweigh the actual VIX futures market, right? They didn't fully anticipate how the size would matter in that 15 minute aftermarket rebalancing. But uh, I heard a lot of that back then too, you know, lawsuits, we're gonna get our money back. It's It behaved exactly as it said it would in the prospectus, it's just that that aftermarket rebalancing had a lot of action. And of course, the market makers have to do what they have to do. They have to let those prices go and they went sky high and the rebalancing cost a fortune. And then you go from regular market hours, XIV was down about 35, 33%. And then it was down 95% 15 minutes later. There's no lawsuit there. It's, it's just, that's what happens. And it's the same thing here. Unfortunately, I'm not telling you, you know, that I'm not sympathetic, I am, but, uh, Everything that they're doing on AMC, and if your broker does raise, raise margin requirements on you, say Monday morning you wake up and you're in a margin call, you don't know why, the price hasn't changed, but you're in a margin call anyway, they're allowed to do that. So be fully aware that they are allowed to manage their business any way they see fit. And they don't want you to go negative in your account. So they will do whatever they can to make sure that doesn't happen. They probably want to dangle the carrots to make you trade more, but they don't want you to trade so badly that you actually end up owing them money and then you can't pay. So they probably, I mean, maybe this is a pessimistic view, but they probably want you to go bankrupt active trading, but they don't want you to go below zero. So they can adjust margin and maintenance anytime they want. And um, you're not gonna have any recourse to get any money that you lost back. Sorry about that. All right, I had only 1,500 to start with and turned it into 24,000 during the week. We just went up to 70-ish. I held on too long, but still held on to 11,000 gains. When your strike hits, should you cash out? Well, what was your strike? I mean, you, I don't, did you realistically think you were gonna go from 1,500 to 24,000? And this is one of the things that it, it always surprises me I'm not trying to word this in a way that I'm calling you inexperienced, but was that a realistic expectation for anybody that you're gonna take money and just make 15 times your money, just like that? I don't know. I mean, when you say if it hits your strike, should you cash out? Why wasn't your strike $2,000? Like you, you put 1500 in and a week later you're at 2000 and you're not looking for the exit. I don't know what that would even feel like. Um, I'm a long-term investor. I'm perfectly happy making my 15 or 20% a year for the next 30 years, working, saving my money, investing it in my account, putting the money in there and letting it go 10 times as big over 30 year period. So when people say things to me like this, I can't believe you held on to it longer than a $2,000 profit, to be honest. So I, I guess this is what they call diamond hands or laser eyes or whatever, whatever the, uh, you know, I'm old. I, I don't know what these, these sayings are, but that is some serious diamond hands there. Congratulations. I mean, you're up 11,000. Wow.
that is an absolute slam dunk that I don't mean to be pessimistic again, but you may never repeat that success. So don't get used to this. Don't think that investing is about starting at 1500 and eventually, oh, I guess I'll have to settle for my 11 grand profit. No, you start with 1500 and if you get to 1600, that's really good. So uh, remember the vast majority of the investment world, like over 90% of the investment world makes less than 5% a year long-term. So you making 1500% in, you know, seemingly moments, uh, that's a slam dunk that may never come around again. So congrats. Good job. I can't tell you to sell or not, but can't give out any direct investment advice. I can just say for me, I would have been out at two grand for sure. I wouldn't have been in in the first place, but I would have been out at 2000. Absolutely. Um, sorry, I shouldn't have highlighted this. I'll tell you a little quick story. Um, so back in 2001, I believe, somewhere around 2001, uh, back then I was playing professional golf and I was in Phoenix, I was in Scottsdale and I was out, I, I'm a runner, so I'm always out running. And back then, this is gonna age myself, but back then I used to run with my Discman. I don't know if any of you even know what a Discman is, but CDs, right, you know what CDs are, but we used to actually have portable Discmans that were big. I mean, just like this big with a CD and all the buttons on top, so the thing's like that big. And I had to sort of jerry-rig this thing that I could clip it on my belt. And I used to run with that thing. And then I believe it was 2001, 2002, maybe around there. I bought the iPod, my first iPod, right? The little iPod. It was actually pretty big and thick, but it was small. And it was just a game changer for my running. So I went out and I bought Apple shares. And I remember I bought Apple at $17. Now it's, it's done several splits along the way. So that's not equivalent to the 17. Um, I believe it did a seven to one split and then a uh, four to one after that. But I bought Apple stock at 17 pre seven to one split, pre four to one split. I bought, I don't know, $30,000 of shares or something like that. I loved the iPod, so I bought those shares. If I held on to those shares, if I had diamond hands or laser, whatever, um, I don't even know what it would be worth. Like, million, 50 million. I don't even know what it would be worth, right? I'd have to go through those numbers. But I sold my Apple shares eight months later at $78, I think. I mean, I just killed it, right? 17 to seven, no, 17 to, um, it was less than 64, maybe. It was less than four times the money, but it was almost four times. Um, if I had diamond hands, this view would be a lot nicer. Um, but that's the thing with me, I don't enter trades thinking I'm gonna, it just it, beyond my wildest dreams that I would triple or quadruple my money, let alone 100 or 200%. So I'm out, I, I am not that type of investor. If you're looking for somebody who can sort of help you navigate how to manage a trade that's 2000% in the money, I can tell you I've never had one. So I, I will only ever speak from experience and I do not have diamond hands, I'm a long-term volatility trader, managing risk, options trader. I like derivatives because it's a risk management tool, not a speculative tool. That's why I derivative trade, um, because of the risk management aspect. I got into AMC at 52, okay, holding strong, holding 550 bananas as part of Ape community. Again, I'm old, speak to me like I'm, you know, your grandfather. I, I've obviously seen a few memes about apes and bananas, but Okay, bought at 52, good luck. Like I said, it could go to 200, it could go to 10. Um, you do you. It's not a trade that I would, ever, uh, I would ever get into. What do you think of ETFs that also use a percent in covered calls to increase yields? Is it better to use this ETFs when vol is high or when index is making new highs? So I hate covered calls in general. The only times I sell covered calls is, again, the wheel of fun strategy if you sell the put, you happen to get assigned the shares. I turn around and sell super aggressive covered calls, like as close to the money as possible, to just get rid of the shares. That's the only time I use covered calls. Otherwise, in general, I think covered calls is one of the most overrated options trades that there is. You'll see tons of people say, you know, you hold the shares. You hold the shares anyway, why not sell the covered calls? Well, the reason you don't do it is because during stable periods, when the stock's just climbing higher and you wanna make a little bit of money, Volatility is so low that those premiums are not worth it. And of course, you don't want to lose your shares. 
So you have to sell well out of the money. Essentially, you're bringing in a tiny amount of premium, but you've not hedged any risk. If the stock goes down, that little covered call is not going to cover anything really significant. It may be 0.5% of your losses or something. So you're not reducing risk by selling covered calls. All you're really doing is capping your gains. And so I don't think it's a good trade-off, personally. I don't think it's ever really worth it. The only times that covered calls is worth it is when volatility is very high and you are actively trying to get rid of the shares. Then covered calls, you can sell those juicy premiums and you can actually get paid for, you know, paid on your way out the door basically. But uh, no, covered calls in general, super overrated. And any ETF that has, you know, these dynamic ETFs that do these types of things, all you have to do is look at their long-term performance. It's worse than the underlying almost always because you're capping your gains, you're not reducing your losses. And yeah, it does fine if everything cooperates and it just slowly bleeds up, but uh, it doesn't work so well when the market does unexpected things. So the long-term performance of those types of funds, not great. Yeah, my car is just a smashed window. And you know, the thing that bothered me, there was actually several things were stolen, right? So um, I don't want to really talk about the money too much, but one of the victories is that as some of you probably know, if you wear suits for your job, suit shoes can be super expensive. And I tend to be kind of a minimalist. I buy, I, I can travel the world on two suitcases. All my belongings fit in two suitcases plus a small trunk, like a wh whatever, a tiny vehicle trunk. Um, so I had three pairs of shoes. I had um, my golf shoes. I had some, just some normal shoes. And then I bought some suit shoes and they were super expensive. I'm not gonna say how much they were, but they were obscenely expensive. And they took my running shoes and my just regular, you know, Hugo Boss $140 whatever sneakers. Um, and they left the suit shoes, which were, again, I don't want to even say, I'm embarrassed to say, but they left those. So that was a victory for me. Um, they, took, they, they took my golf clubs out of the car, dragged it out of the back window, and only took the driver and rescue. They left the woods. They left everything in the bag. They just took the driver and rescue. And that driver I had just put together. I bought a brand new Callaway Maverick. I custom ordered, uh, you know, a prototype a Ventus shaft. Everything was perfect. The whole thing, golf clubs typically cost about 600 for a driver. That thing was like 1500. It was custom. I ordered it. I waited months. Back ordered those Ventus shafts. Back ordered for months. Um, I haven't even hit it yet, and it's gone. And then the weird one is. I have sleep apnea. They stole my CPAP machine. Like I don't really use it that much, so it's in the car. Who steals that? But they don't steal some other valuable things. There were some things in the car that they didn't take. Um, I just I was laughing when I was just trying to account for what they stole, like trying to get an idea of who these people are. On the one hand, okay, they stole my cool red shoes, so maybe they're young. But then they stole a CPAP machine, so maybe they're 80. I don't know. <laughs> It, it was really weird, but uh, yeah, it is what it is. Oh, I missed one, sorry. CLF, again, I, I stick to my own strategies. I, I don't really know that type of thing. Um, VTS options is temporarily on hold. We've talked about this quite a bit in our private community, but um, it'll be back soon. Hopefully if I get some time later in the year, I'll bring it back. I just, uh, to be honest, it just didn't, it wasn't as good as I wanted it to be. People liked it. There was a lot of people, you know, I don't know, six, 700 people on the, the service, but uh, I just didn't think that I was giving quite enough. I didn't, I didn't have an underlying course explaining the how. Every email was very detailed. We went over all the trades, all the margin, all the everything to look out for. It was very detailed. But the actual why we're doing it and why it pieces together in the actual broad portfolio, I had a lot of questions about those. And so I just decided to just put it on hold for a little while and I will do a better job next time around. So if you are interested in options, what we do now is sort of tactical trading, short volatility, volatility ETPs, VIX type of things. I've been doing that since 2010, but I've been derivatives trading since 2005. So a lot of the people that follow me do follow for the options content. And right now we don't even have a community. I shut that down. Um, it'll come back. So if you like options stuff, check back in about 
four to six months and we'll have another community going. We'll have live streams. We'll have a course where I can just just tell everybody why I'm doing everything I'm doing. And uh, I think it'll be better. But thanks for the heads up. I didn't fully realize that the site itself was down. Is it down? Let me check the site. Is VTS options. Um, well, it's not down for me. I don't know if that means because I'm logged in or not. Um, there's still a few things on the website, like each one of these strategies, like if you click them, for example, there is still videos on all of these, um, like 10, 15 minute videos on all of these basic option strategies. If you want to know what a broken wing butterfly is, there's a, you know, a full, I don't know, 10 minutes and 38 second video on broken wing butterflies, but the actual, like what people pay me for, that's all been removed. All of those people that were paying me, um, yeah, hopefully they stick around. Hopefully they'll come back. But I just didn't feel like I was delivering enough. Um, so I'm going to make it better next time. Price prediction for AMC next week. Since I'm not in any trades, full disclosure, I'm not in any trades. Oh, I missed a question. I'm going to get back to yours, Brian. I see it's a good one. Um, price prediction for next week. Honestly, I'm shocked it stayed this high. Typically what we would see, and this we have to give insane credit to the Wall Street people, the all the investors in, in this thing that are that are basically going against the grain here. Anybody who's still holding it, I mean, congratulations. It's all awesome stuff because in the past, it's not like stocks didn't have their runs in the past too. We've seen stuff like this, but what typically happened in the past, so it's going from $2 to $20. We've seen stuff like that before. But you can see this giant fade here. What typically happens is in the normal pattern in the old school markets, right? I'm kind of an older guy. We would see this fade. You'd expect another bump. So what would end up happening is it would go up here. You'd expect it to go down again because obviously this is unsustainable. The company itself didn't suddenly overnight improve. So you expect this. Then you always have to expect a secondary bounce, but it's typically not going to reach the same level as the previous one. So this is totally normal. And then you can see it's starting to fade. Old school thinking would be that right here, you stick a fork in it. It's done. You short it, or not short it directly, but you use intelligent option strategies and you get short exposure. Let me word it that way. Um, because typically it would just bleed down to whatever it was at before. What we're seeing in the last year or two with things like AMC and GameStop and all those things, um, Bed Bath & Beyond, there's tons of them, right? Um, incredible resilience. I am absolutely blown away that it did this and then just floored that it did this. So now, like I said in my original, you know, the reasons you shouldn't sell naked calls, all that stuff I went into, well now, it's already doubled on itself five times this year. Why couldn't it do a couple more? Why couldn't it go to 200 or more? It wouldn't surprise me at this point, but it also wouldn't surprise me if it bleeds back down to the previous level that is sort of a little bit more reasonable. Uh, this is around $10. It was only there a month ago. That wouldn't surprise me either. So gun to my head, since you're asking in the Q&A, and I, always, I don't like to punt on questions. Um, I answer everything, no matter what. Next Friday, this is not trade advice. Do not listen to me. Next Friday, AMC is going to be at $33. Midweek, I think it'll make one more little run and then it's gonna go back down. It's gotta fizzle out. It's AMC's a garbage company. It's not worth anything. How long, I mean, I'm impressed, just continuously impressed by the resilience of these traders. But I mean, how long can you hold it up for, honestly? If it was me, again, this is not investment advice, but if I was sitting on a big profit right now, I'd be so gone. I mean, don't try to be cool online with your diamond hands or whatever they call it. Look out for yourself. Always look out for yourself. If you've made a nice profit and you're happy with where it is, I can't tell you to sell, but don't be afraid to sort of, you know, don't go broadcasting it on Wall Street on Reddit. You, you might get banned from the forum or something. I don't know how they work there, but um, nothing wrong with uh, looking after your own best interests and taking a little profit off the table. Vanessa always pops by to say hi. Yep. Thank you. 
Oh, I said I'd go back to one. Sorry, I shouldn't click all these. Um, I have a bad habit of doing that. I missed this one from Brian. What do you think of Wheel of Fortune? I call it a Wheel of Fun. You can call it a Wheel of Fortune. So if you launch your website, you can call it the Wheel of Fortune. That name's already taken by Pat Sajak and the crew. So um, I'm going to take uh, Wheel of Fun is what I call mine. Um, for anybody jumping in late, selling naked puts. If you get assigned, sell aggressive covered calls to get rid of it. Rinse, repeat. Um, could it work on VXX and VXE for my 20%? You know I can't give out direct personalized investment advice, but no, I would never do that. That's why I don't do it. For our vol trend strategy that does sell put options on VXX, typically 4 to 7% out of the money, something like that, weekly cycles, um, not just churning. We don't do churning, but um, no, I don't ever take assignment. I really don't because VXX, while it's not quite as crazy wild, wild west as AMC and GameStop, it's a fast mover. And if you hold shares over the weekend, you're kind of taking your fate in your own hands there. You, you could wake up Monday with a very nice profit on your hands, but you could also get burned pretty badly. So I don't ever take profit. I don't, I don't take the shares and then sell covered calls. I always do something with the put. So I will either A, just get out of the trade, or B, get out of it and then immediately open a new trade for the following week. One of those two things. I, I don't think it's ever a good idea to hold underlying shares for any significant amount of time. Take those day to day, certainly day to day. <clears throat> Selling naked calls is the same as going short. It is the same market bias, but they're not the same trade because when you're short the calls, of course, margins can change as well. Don't Brokers can just suddenly say, okay, now it costs you twice as much to hold it. They can do that. But selling naked calls is specifically more risky than shorting the stock directly because of the reasons that I went into. Price-wise, it's the same bias. It's totally risky. They're both undefined risk. You can lose way more than you can make. But short calls have that implied volatility aspect to them that is very dangerous. And, um, and then it also has specific issues with uh, constantly changing margins, which uh, I, I would say selling naked calls, riskiest of the risky, shorting the shares directly, also super stupid, don't do that. Um, but second, definitely um, not quite as bad as selling naked calls. There's one, I, I hesitate to talk about other people. Again, I. I mean, just in general, I just, I can't help but not respect what, what Sawsnop has done. So I hope that it didn't, hope nobody's trashing and hope it didn't come across that I was. I certainly was not. Um, not a joke at all. They, they constantly pound selling strangles. Quite often mechanically when IV is higher. Well, then I'm going to have to respectfully deviate from that in the sense that Selling naked strangles and straddles isn't in of itself the worst thing you can do, but it is only for the most experienced traders to be getting into that because it is, a, it is an unlimited loss trade. You've got all the problems with the implied volatility. You've got the problems with brokers changing margin on you. All the same things for naked calls apply. It's just that obviously when you bring in two-sided premium and you know, it, it expands your profit range and it makes it slightly safer. But again, that's just Karen the super trader stuff. That's just, I mean, we've seen this movie. How many times do we have to watch this movie before we understand, I know how this one ends. So yeah, I mean, when you're selling naked premium of any kind, not iron condors, those are defined risk, not butterflies, iron butterflies, none of that. Those are defined risk. We'll get into those tomorrow. Remember, come back again. We didn't get to the three best, but I'm going to get to those soon in a, in a future stream. Um, but selling naked premium, you're going to have success for a while. You're going to collect those juicy premiums. And then one day the market's going to do something that you didn't think could happen. And uh, you're going to realize instantly, oh, I see why everybody warns me against that. So I, I, hope, I hope that's not what's happening over there. You can't just look at IV and say, oh, it's high. High compared to what? IV is relative, always relative. What is high? 52-week IV rank? 
okay, it gets you a little bit closer to a metric that's useful, but certainly that is a relative term as well. That, that just means 52 weeks. Volatility can go extremely high. People don't realize all the bad things that can happen. So thank you for the nice compliment and thank you for showing up to the stream. We've been going for an hour and 30 minutes. I just feel bad that I was rambling on for 45 minutes about all the terrible ways to trade this thing. And I kind of shortchanged people on the, uh, the Q and A, which again, I, I want to be that person who will answer your questions. Cause I know that, and rightfully so, I mean, people are busy, but you're never going to get your questions answered by, um, by very many people. So I definitely want to, I want to open up my time more hedge funds, naked shorting. I don't know. And this is another thing that I would warn people against. Sometimes people think if you look at the, you know, whatever level two data, or you look at the, the trades coming through the tape, you can sort of gauge what other people are doing. You have to be really, really careful of that. Because even if you see things happening, and even if you see certain reports of, you know, hedge funds are doing this, and this is their holdings, and you never know if it's part of a broader trade with a totally different market bias. So as an example, sometimes people look at the trades coming through in the options world and, oh, I can see somebody, 50 cent trader, he bought all these calls, right? He bought all these VIX calls. So people think, well, that's a bearish market position. Clearly you're buying VIX calls because you think the market's going to crash. So 50 cent trader must be a genius. Well, it could very easily be that 50 cent trader has a massively long portfolio, net long the market portfolio. And they're buying those calls as a hedge against the portfolio. And if the calls make a bunch of money, it means their portfolio lost a bunch of money. So you never really know, unless you are that person, you don't know what their bias is. So all of these ways we're trying to gauge what the bias of hedge funds are, what the bias of these big whale traders are, I would caution people against that because it could be the exact opposite. It really could. So... Um, be careful of that. We, we don't know unless you're them, unless you're in the room with them. And I don't get invited to those meetings. So nobody tells me what their biases are. I just stick to my own stuff and, and that's it. You gave examples where volatility goes up and volatility goes down when the stock drops. Doesn't volatility usually go up when the stock drops? Yeah, typically. But the problem here is that it's already at 250%. So that's not the expected outcome in this case. If, if, um, if it drops, what we would expect is volatility to decline because it just simply can't stay at 250% for very long. So when I said that, you know, let's say, for example, if you're buying a put option, I said that the volatility will very likely collapse on you. So that's, um, that's this trade here. I said, well, what's typically going to happen, this is what people think they're facing. But as AMC is dropping down, you think you're making a profit, but then you get a volatility adjustment and that's what happens. Your long put option actually doesn't make any money because volatility dropped so much. That's because the starting point is so insane that yes, if it goes back to 20 or lower even 10, why would that happen? Well, that would be because the interest is waning. That would be because People are starting to sell, things are getting back to normal, and that 250% volatility would probably likely go down. That's why I said also, the person who's selling the naked call, they're under the impression that they're pulling in this juicy premium. What they don't realize is that if AMC goes to 150, typically we say when, when stocks go up, volatility comes down, right? That is not going to be the case if AMC goes to 150. If AMC goes to 150, we, we might be looking at volatility peaks like this again. That is very light. Like, look at this ramp up here. You can see the price up here. As it's climbing, volatility is climbing. That's what's happening. So, yes, it's kind of bizarro world right now, where typically you would say if it's going down, volatility declines. Not with AMC at 260% IV right now. It is likely the opposite. Good entry point for AMC calls for the next week. Well, there's never a good entry point for calls of any kind because, again, you're paying so much for the contract that the risk-reward ratio is pretty bad. But if you wanted a, a way to... I, I, I don't want to tease it too much, but 
in the next stream, among the best trades, I'm gonna be talking about the difference between buying long call verticals versus buying long calls directly. And I just think buying long call verticals wins every single time. So uh, tune into a future stream, probably tomorrow or, or Monday. I'd say within the next two days, we'll get to those ones. But uh, yeah, I, 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 give me a chance to talk you into turning that long call into a long call vertical. You have to adapt to the market and its trends, absolutely. Remaining rigid on anything is a great way to lose money. Um, don't knock the YouTubers. Is that talking to me or someone else? I don't knock YouTubers. Oh, what you might be saying is when I see, you know, YouTubers with 100,000 followers who I said, you know, I know for sure they don't know how to make money. Uh, maybe that's what you mean. I, I'm not, you know, ignoring the fact that there are some people who are good at trading, but very few and far between. And typically if someone has that large of an audience, you have to admit it's based on shock of some sort. I mean, it's based on hype of some sort, right? It's not people like me um, who talk about safety and risk management and controlling losses and doubling your money, you know, waiting five years to double your money rather than one. It's typically not people like me that get the big audiences. So it's actually hard for me. The advantage is, I mean, I'm not complaining. The advantage is that the people that do follow my work typically are pretty strong supporters where on the other side, if people are just doing those shock trading, they can just move on to the next guy so quickly. They can just unfollow and go to the next one. And they're all kind of the same. There's no real differentiation between them. They're all just trying to shock each other. Like watch me turn 5,000 into 10,000 in a month. In the next, a month later, another channel will be saying, watch me turn $1,500 into 20,000. And it only took me three weeks. And then the other person's gonna say, okay, well now I want the followers. Watch me turn a thousand into a million. You know, it just gets, it just goes and goes and goes. I promise you, you will never see me make those videos ever. Um, yeah, that was my only point. I'm not knocking people. I mean, I, I would never stand in the way of somebody making their money. I, I support all people starting businesses and getting their name out there and building a brand. Good, you do your thing. But I'm on the side of helping people curtail risk and actually make money that is long lasting. I'm trying to get people to be multimillionaires 20 years from now, not this year, if that makes some sense. And every single person, we've got 200 people here still. I'm gonna wrap this up, That's I've gone way too long, but 200 people watching, every single one of you can retire a multimillionaire. I've, I've given you all the tools, all my videos, articles, follow it. I don't mean the trades, you don't have to pay me money, they're all free. Um, Get yourself a good job, live below your means, save as much as you can, build a long-term stable investment portfolio that'll make you know your 10 to 20% annual return, be consistent, manage drawdowns. 20, 20 years from now, 25 years from now, you'll be a multimillionaire, guarantee it. Problem is, one of the biggest input variables to building wealth is time. And when you suffer massive drawdowns by doing stupid things, getting yourself into way more trouble than you thought you would, that costs you time. It might cost you five or 10 years of your timeline. And then even if you do eventually recover to that same point, well, you've lost 10 years. That could be a million dollars you lost. You might think, well, I lost 50 grand on AMC. No big deal. Is it 50 grand or is it five years? That's a very big difference between those two. Don't lose time. Uh, don't ever do anything that costs you more than a few months, ideally, but certainly no more than a year. I mean, don't forget that from 2007, October 2007 to March 2013, the S&P 500 was in a drawdown, right? It was a six, you know, five and a half year drawdown from 2000, March 2000 to, to March 2013, the S&P 500 was in a drawdown, 13 years. So a lot of people reference these, oh, the stock market, you can't even beat the S&P. I don't want to compete against the S&P. That's child's play to beat the S&P. Stretch it out over 20 years, it's not even gonna be a fair comparison, right? Um, just remember that the factor is time and don't spend, don't waste too much time because you tried to accelerate your timeline and then you ended up losing five years. That's, uh, it's not the money. It's not always the money. People that oh, I can afford to lose 50 grand. It's not the money. It's the time that it's the setback. It's the, now you've only got 15 years of compounding instead of 20 or 25. That's the problem. 
What's the purpose of hedge funds to be bearish if the market is bullish? Well, first of all, the assumption that hedge funds are bearish, um, some are, surely some are, but um, I don't know if you're being technical with this, but the, the term hedge fund doesn't mean hedging. This is a common thing, like people say, you know, if a hedge fund loses 20% in a market crash, they're like, well, isn't a hedge fund supposed to hedge? It's just a name. A hedge fund itself is just a legal structure. That's all it is. It's just a, think of it as a legal document that classifies them as a hedge fund. It's not necessarily the method that they use to invest. They're not hedging as a hedge fund. It's just hedge funds are all different market biases. You can have ones that are heavily short. You can have some that are long short, that are 120 long compared to 20 short. You can have all kinds of different short vol hedge funds. They're all different. So for us to assume that they're bearish, um, yeah, that would be silly. I, I, as I said earlier, markets do trend upwards over time. It would be very silly for a person to have a negative bias on the overall market. Now, risk management should play a heavy role. You should be willing to exit trades and to hedge and to be patient and not try to swing at every pitch. But at the same time, you should not be negative on the market long term. That's clearly a losing strategy. So I would totally agree with this. If a hedge fund was long term bearish, I don't know what charts they're looking at, but that's not the stock market that I see. So I'm always looking for ways to participate in the general uptrend of stocks, the general downtrend of short volatility, while still hedging and maintaining safety. But I'm certainly not going to take a, a short market bias or a long vol bias. That would be silly. Sounds like a very, very quick and easy way to lose money. So I don't follow Macy's stock. We haven't even started yet. Don't know what that means. Oh, probably you're probably an AMC bull. Haven't even started yet. Yeah, I mean, I'm out of it, so I'll, I'll cross my fingers and hope for the best. If it goes to 200, I think that'd be awesome. That'd be great to see. I cringe at how many people selling naked calls will be margin called, but that'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Go for the lawsuit. Attorneys have to eat. Yeah. Well, you'll make some money for the the person that you hire to do the lawsuit. Might not get any money yourself, but you'll, you'll give somebody a job. You'll give a lawyer a job. Do they need jobs? Are they struggling? I don't know. All right. So uh, one more. Attorneys kill families. So sorry about the focus pulsing on, uh, on this lens here. I can see it when I'm looking at myself. Tomorrow I'm going to do manual focus. So like I said, I didn't get to the three, in my opinion, safer, best ways to trade AMC. So I will give plenty of heads up. Follow me on Twitter so you're always notified. It's at Volatility VIX. Twitter is sort of the place that is most reliable to get my articles, videos, live streams, all that stuff. Plus just general stupid comments. Um, occasionally UFC stuff. Um, really pulling for Marvin Vittori to beat Adesanya tonight. And I just hope Nate Diaz doesn't get retired in an absolute bloodbath because uh, Leon Edwards is the real deal. Um, but yeah, follow me on Twitter. I don't want to plug my website. I don't want to do anything like that. We're done. <laughs> Thanks everybody for watching. There was a lot of you here, a lot of you AMC traders. If you're, I mean, if you're participating and you're profitable, I think that's great. I think that the world has changed. When I said, you know, back in the day, it would have gone up and spiked and fizzled out. That's exactly what would have happened. But uh, that's not what's happening. The, the, there is some definite staying power with these types of things. And when this AMC thing finally fizzles out and dies, which it will, AMC as an underlying company is not a good one. So don't think that it's just going to forever be at 70. But when this fizzles out and dies, I would imagine there will be another target to talk about. So this is here to stay. The social media influence is a real thing. People, fund managers out there, if you're watching, asset managers, don't bet against social media. That is a terrible, terrible idea. So uh, thanks, everybody. Enjoy the weekend. Enjoy the UFC 263 tonight. And um, I'm going to try to put something together. Maybe we'll just jump right in and do it tomorrow. But I will tell everybody on Twitter. Thanks a lot. Take care.